Hello. Welcome once more. This is Dr. Advocate Milton. I hold a PhD in international criminal law. I am the founder chairman and director of Center for International Criminal Justice in Africa. Today's lecture is going to delve into something uh, which advances from the past lectures that we held. In the previous lectures, in retrospect, you'll recall that we dealt with uh, the structure of the International Criminal Court. We looked at the various organs and divisions that exist within uh, those organs in the court. Uh, we also looked at the crimes, the key crimes, the article, what I referred to as Article 5 crimes, uh, or as enshrined in the Rome Statute. Uh, basically, what I did was to create a background for us to be able to proceed so that we have a basis upon which to make analysis and discussion of the next topic. Um, just a few points I want to mention before I plunge into the, uh, the topic of uh, today. Uh, the first thing that uh, about the treaty, the Rome uh, Statute, it is clear, something that we need to know is that the court had jurisdiction or has jurisdiction over matters relating to those crimes that are within the Rome Statute. Only those matters that were committed, offenses that were committed after the statute was ratified, after it came into force. It has no retroactive jurisdiction. What I mean, it cannot try retrospectively an offense that was carried out before the Rome Statute itself came into existence. Uh, that is very clear. Uh, that's a clear principle within uh, criminal law as well, municipal criminal law. So that is uh, as to be understood. Secondly, for those states that were not party to the Rome Statute at the time of its inception, but decided to join, um, to sign and be part of the Rome Statute, uh, to adopt it at a later time, let's say one adopts it around the year to 2010, then the act again, the, the, whatever acts or crimes that are committed prior to that state coming into action would in general not be under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. What are we saying? What we are saying here is that the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court is not retroactive. In other words, it does not go beyond when, uh, one, the statute was put in force, two, when a state joins, it does not go beyond the time that it had not been part of the Rome Statute. But there's an exception to that. If and only if that particular state allows itself to be bound by acts or allows itself to have those acts that amount to offenses to be examined by the court, if notwithstanding that before it ratified. If the state allows that, then that would be clear that the court would have jurisdiction over those offenses. Absent that consent, the court has no jurisdiction. The International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction. It has no power to examine, to be able to interrogate, to investigate and prosecute crimes that were carried out before a party, a, a state party, became a party to the Rome Statute. Okay, that, that has to be made clear because as we go on, uh, it may find its play uh, in the system of our discussion today. Uh, the other issue that I need to bring in that has uh, a bearing on what we'll be discussing uh, is that um, there are two key issues here. At the time of deliberations to bring about um, the existence of the court, the International Criminal Court, or the passing of the Rome Statute, there were two key principles that were in tussle. 
what am I saying? I'm saying there are two principles that kept the parties to the negotiations seeking to balance them. One of them was sovereignty of states, the principle of sovereignty, meaning independence and the ability to, to do their own things. Uh, one argument was in favor of sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the other argument that was also looking at the issue of uh, the need to maintain international security and peace globally. So there was globalization on the one hand and there was sovereignty of the individual states. What am I saying? I'm trying to put the point across that during the negotiations of all this, the deliberations took into account these two principles and they tried to incorporate these two principles within uh, in form of the text of the Rome Statute. And that gave birth to the principle of complementarity, whereby the International Criminal Court continued to respect the sovereign rights, the primacy of the national states to be able to own its own process by prosecuting, investigating the crimes under its jurisdiction and the nationals that fall under their jurisdiction. While at the same time, it took into account the interests of globalization, those who sought to have the interest of global peace and international security by creating Article 17 of the complementarity to allow the court in the interest of international peace to be able to have jurisdiction where the primacy of the national state does not deliver the justice that is unspeakable. Okay, uh, with that brief background, I want us to plunge into the topic of today. The discussion today, having looked at all that we looked at previously, will now shift to be able to see how the court processes work. What, how does the court operate? How does the International Criminal Court function? We have looked at all these organs, the, the prosecutor, uh, the, the judges, the trial chambers, but what is the systematic way in which the court is able to function and carry out its mandate? Now, uh, this is going to be discussed under what I call the trigger mechanisms for the International Criminal Court jurisdiction. Trigger mechanism to trigger comes, for instance, you have a, a pistol to trigger, to pull the trigger firearm is to release, to set to release a bullet, for instance. So we, we are saying how, what processes take place to be able to unleash the jurisdiction, the power to be able to uh, look into the cases by the ICC. That is a very interesting and very, very important topic. It's important that you should be able to follow it because once you miss the key elements of that particular topic, you may be fumbling over the other elements and concepts that we'll be discussing in other lectures. So I'll proceed systematically. Having looked at the issue that sovereignty versus internationalization or globalization interests, which led to the issue were key considerations of compromise at the deliberations of uh, the Rome Conference uh, to be able to come up with the compromise of the Rome Statute. We now want to see how does the court, the International Criminal Court, have its power? How does it, how is it initiated that the jurisdiction uh, is triggered? How does it come to possess the power and start operating? We have the powers, the jurisdiction elements uh, set out in the Rome Statute, but how is it triggered? Okay, that is the basis of our discussion uh, right now. Uh, right away from the start, um, I may want to state that there are three means through which the jurisdiction of the ICC may be triggered. The first instance, the first trigger mechanism is where a case is referred by a state party to the ICC 
to be able to take over and pursue the investigations and prosecution. So the first trigger mechanism is referral by the state party. Uh, <clears throat> it may be argued that also a non-state party may accept jurisdiction of uh, the court and also make a referral. But as a general rule, the state parties can make that referral. They may refer the matter before the ICC to proceed with the investigations and ultimate disposition uh, through litigation and prosecution of the matter that is with them. Number two, I'll come back to that and go into the nitty gritty of it. Number two, uh, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court may also at her own initiative, upon his own initiative or her own initiative, bring about initiate proceedings, start of the prosecution, investigation of a matter. And that is what we call in the term the prosecutor may proprio motu, proprio motu, proprio motu, on his own initiative or her own initiative, uh, instigate uh, the proceedings to be started on based on the evidence. But this one can only be done, the prosecutor can only proceed after approaching as we saw in retrospect previously, the pretrial chamber to be able to authorize that these investigations proceed. As we shall see, the pretrial chamber is a very important sieve or safeguard in ensuring that there is justice in the entire process and integrity, as we said in the last lecture. It will look at the matter, whether the matter before it or to be initiated is politically motivated or uh, any other factor that would be able to, that would be inimical to uh, the interest of justice of any of the parties uh, to the prosecution and investigation. The third trigger mechanism through which the ICC jurisdiction may be acquired and exercised is where the United Nations Security Council makes a referral of a case that has come before it to the ICC to proceed with the prosecution. That power to refer has can be made regardless of whether the individual has nationality is a national of any of the state parties, so this, or whether it was carried out in a territory of a non-state party. What are we saying? The point we try and put across is that when the United Nations Security Council makes a referral of a matter to the ICC for prosecution, It does not matter whether the individual which are, who are subject of that referral are nationals of a non-state party or the crime entail was committed in the territory of a non-state party. So those are the three points. And it's important now to immediately plunge into the issue of uh, qualifications. Since I've mentioned nationality and territoriality, uh, when the ICC in general conducts its uh, proceedings or investigations and uh, adopts uh, the jurisdiction, seeks to adopt the jurisdiction, ordinarily as a matter of principle, it would confine, it would be limited. That's where the other point is that the ICC jurisdiction is not unlimited. It's limited not only to those matters which are handled by the state, party that are unwilling and genuinely unable genuinely to conduct the proceedings 
fairly, but it also cannot, as a general rule, initiate proceedings against individuals who are not, or states who are not parties to the statute. Or if the offense was carried out in a territory of a non-state party, it is deprived of that jurisdiction. So we have the two principles, but these two principles of territoriality and nationality can also be tied to another important principle, which is the traditional principle in international law. It is commonly understood that the states have primacy, ordinarily actually, even prior to the International Criminal Court being born, the national states and continue to have, they had and continue to have authority and jurisdiction over their nationals wherever the offenses are committed. Two, they also have jurisdiction over individuals who commit offenses within their territory. So there's the question of territoriality. The offense was committed in a particular territory. They're able to exercise jurisdiction over that. So when we talk about um, the International Criminal Court seeking to carry out complementarity exercise under Article 17 of the Rome Statute, it is simply saying, we are simply saying that that exercise of power is done notwithstanding that it's known that the state, the national state, the national state party to the Rome Statute has that jurisdiction as a matter of inherent uh, authority over its individuals, nationals within, and also those that have committed offense within its territory. Okay, so uh, we, we just want to score, underscore this point that uh, the ICC is not necessarily unlimited in its authority. It has limited jurisdiction based on the issue of individuals, based on the issue of state parties, based even sometimes on the age of uh, the persons who are suspects before court, the ages where there are restrictions in terms of prosecution. And uh, it cannot act retroactively. The ICC has no jurisdiction over offenses of genocide or um, crimes against humanity that were committed prior to 1st July 2002, before the Rome Statute came into force. So there are limitations, there are constraints uh, that uh, make it appear that actually the ICC is not unlimited. But one thing for sure is that, which is not in dispute, is that the court has even enshrined in its own uh, text is a court which is a permanent institution, as opposed to being ad hoc. It exists perpetually. It does not exist by virtue of some authority that expires, such as the ad hoc tribunals that we had, as we cited last time, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. All those had their mandate confined to particular territory and individuals. And upon exhaustion, we now have the uh, mechanism system in place after restore mechanism after those courts, those tribunals had conducted proceedings at some point. So it, it is a question of winding up. They, they become factors, uh, fact, they become non operational, just to put it in lay sense and clear, once their mandate has been executed. They become factors official, to use the technical term. The other thing that we need to know about the court is that it is complementary to the primary jurisdiction 
of the national state, the national domestic criminal jurisdiction. It is not universal in its operation because it has a limit which are imposed upon it by virtue of territorial uh, territoriality and by virtue of uh, nationality and many other factors. All right, so uh, let's get back. Having looked at all those, uh, we now want to get back to see uh, what are these mechanisms all about. Uh, let's go back. We've just indicated very clearly that uh, the first we indicated that a matter may be referred to the International Criminal Court by a state party. That is done notwithstanding the fact which we all know that the national state party retains the primacy, it has primacy over the exercise of jurisdiction over its own nationals and for those crimes committed uh, within its territory by even non-nationals, even members, nationals of non-state parties who commit those offenses within uh, uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, so clearly, what is entailed in the referral by state party? As we said, the principle of complementarity is very, very important. It is so important to the point that the ICC in general, by and large, cannot proceed to investigate and prosecute a case which is being conducted, fairly conducted, not sham uh, proceedings before a state party. Once there's a parallel proceedings going on within a state party, the International Criminal Court divests itself, deprives itself of that jurisdiction. But of course, as we said, the assumption is that those proceedings and prosecution are genuinely conducted. They are not just a sham proceeding designed to shield the accused against their responsibility, criminal responsibility. So in the absence of anything to the contrary, the ICC is not supposed to interfere in the conduct of those proceedings. Okay, as a court of the last resort, as I just indicated, Article 17 of the statute becomes very instructive in that it underscores the complementarity principle, the complementary nature or character of the International Criminal Court. So any referral that is made by the state party would always be looked at in that light. Besides, uh, there is a mechanism within the International Criminal Court to ensure that any matter referred to it is not subject to abuse. For example, uh, the state decides to refer matters of, of uh, that the accused are their enemies, political enemies. Um, so politically motivated to instigate prosecution. All those would be sieved off by the pretrial chamber in the sense that uh, no, the confirmation of charges would have to go through the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court before the charges are allowed to proceed or even arrests or any warrants or you know, summons to appear. So that is a same mechanism. Much as we say the office of the prosecutor is independent, the pretrial chamber is always hovering. The judges are always watching what the prosecutor does to ensure that the integrity of the justice process is in place. They don't just watch. They look at the evidence presented before them and decide whether there's plausible ground and justification in law to advance with those charges 
and if not, whether they are not politically motivated, and if not, uh, to not proceed and deny the confirmation of those charges. So that is a safeguard, sufficient safeguard mechanism to ensure that uh, the process has integrity. Okay, so um, you have to always bear in mind that this court, the ICC can only act act where states are unwilling and unable genuinely to investigate or prosecute offenses. So whether the matter is referred to, uh, the, where the ICC takes up jurisdiction, this becomes critical. As we said in retrospect the other time, uh, certain institutions may have, may not be willing to proceed, as we said, they may want to protect, to shield certain suspects against criminal responsibility or going through the entire trial. On the other hand, they may want to use the process to be able to prosecute their political opponents. So these are things that the ISIS, the pretrial chamber carefully examines to ensure that there's no mockery of justice at any point. And where it is realized that none of these are being conformed with, uh, then the ICC steps in and takes over the investigations and prosecution. We indicated yesterday the unable element, the limb of uh, unable genuinely uh, would mean the inability in terms of maybe breakdown of the infrastructure, the social infrastructure in the country because of war or any other activity, economic meltdown, uh, such that we do not even have judges, proper judges sitting to preside over cases, uh, or we have the institutions of justice run down as a result of war or some other catastrophe. And uh, uh, technically, it becomes impossible to run a credible uh, system of justice in that country, uh, or that uh, there is not technical, sufficient technical expertise to be able to manage to investigate. Uh, in such a case, the court, the pretrial chamber may find that actually the state is unable genuinely and would be willing to take over the matter at the International Criminal Court. Okay, it's important also to realize that the gravity, the level of gravity of the matter will be taken into account. Not every matter that comes before the court would be absorbed into the system, because that would definitely overwhelm the International Criminal Court and the systems will break down in no time. So the court, the International Criminal Court, ensures that it will only make admissible those matters which are of sufficient gravity as to justify the intervention of the International Criminal Court. So if there's offenses that are alleged to be uh, crimes against humanity or genocide, are not, of course, as provided outlining the elements. If they are not of sufficient gravity, then they better be handled at national or municipal or domestic level rather than at the International Criminal Court. Uh, so, um, as we said, there is the admissibility process to be able to have the matter admissible before the International Criminal Court. Under this trigger mechanism, uh, the matter would have to come before the pretrial chamber uh, for examination. And uh, all these elements would have to be uh, looked at. And in doing this, at the back of the mind always, there would be a point that the primacy of national prosecution, uh, national criminal prosecution, uh, remains a key point to look at and to respect 
in the, under the limb of the argument of sovereignty of states, as we saw, sovereignty against internationality, internationalism or globalization. So uh, where primacy of the national prosecution, national criminal prosecution is upheld, it goes a long way just to reaffirm, to uh, stress the fact that states have sovereignty. They have a right to run their own affairs as a matter of principle. They, they have the primary right the primacy of jurisdiction rests upon the national states. Okay, so uh, what happens where the matter comes before uh, the pretrial chamber, before the ICC, that is, the prosecutor? Um, it would have to be put before the trial chamber, submitted, so that it ensures that those, as I said, are not politically motivated prosecutions, and that uh, this, as we can see, the, the Americans, the United States had great concern about the ICC based on this fact that uh, the court would uh, probably be used for witch hunt uh, or for politically motivated prosecutions affecting the interests of the citizens of the United States. We have recent cases where uh, President Donald Trump even says the ICC actually has no jurisdiction. And we have seen cases where uh, visas have been denied for those in the court just because they're involved in attempting to go against the interests of the United States. It's a very sensitive issue. And uh, there are threats, as I said, where if the judges act, uh, they would be able to bar them and even arrest them. But that is not the point of discussion at this point. Our point is simply to say, the judges of the pretrial chamber constantly keep an eye over the prosecutor to ensure that nothing which is above board, no matter which has no integrity, goes through into the system to protect the civil folders that are politically motivated and ensure that when the prosecutor has to initiate her own proceedings, authorization must be obtained from the pretrial chamber. Okay. Uh, the other issue that you need not forget is that these crimes, according to the statute, are considered as the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole. That is where the point of gravity comes in. It's not just a crime. It's a crime that qualifies within the international community as a whole who consider that most serious crime, egregious crime of sufficient gravity as to shock the concerns of the entire community. As I said, all these crimes, uh, their elements may be looked at uh, when, you, when you look at Article 5, of course, lists, uh, as I said, the, the crimes of aggression, um, the, uh, the, the war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. And as you proceed between Article 6 and 8, to outline what elements, quite a number of them, the elements that have shoot each these individual crimes. It's important that uh, you look at that. Uh, we dealt with that in the previous lecture, when uh, lecture three, where we handled the Article 5 crimes uh, of uh, under the ICC jurisdiction. So the other limit, just worth noting here, is that the jurisdiction of the ICC is actually limited by the virtue of the crimes it can be able to preside and investigate. Those are Article 5 crimes, Article 5 of the Rome Statute. So it is not able to uh, uh, prosecute or investigate any other crimes that out of the ambit of the provisions of Article 5. It's important to have that uh, borne in mind. All right. Um, so it is clear that uh, we have the Rome Statute 
having to codify for the first time all these crimes, as I said, under uh, when Article 5, right on to 8. Uh, so it, it makes it clear, unlike in the previous uh, regimes, legal regimes, where uh, the crimes would be uh, dealt with ad hoc, by the ad hoc tribunals, uh, where there's nothing clear by the tribunals that would exist. And uh, those tribunals were strictly under the watch of the Security Council that uh, put them in place. And uh, so it is clear that that particular element uh, has been dealt with the codification. But it's important to qualify, even as we say that all these crimes are committed, which would be tried, for instance, the United Nations Security Council would be able to refer a case before the ICC situation, irrespective of whether the national is one of, uh, belongs to one of the state parties, or whether it was committed in the territory of uh, a, a non-state party. However, the new, once the crime of aggression is being dealt with, as I indicated in the last lecture, that uh, the crime of aggression only had to come for when the Kampala Review Conference um, uh, convened sometime in June, uh, May, June of uh, 2010. Uh, that is, that crime, of course, the limitation doesn't have to apply the rest in terms of who qualifies to be, uh, you know, to, to come under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. What I'm saying is, much as those referrals are, are regardless of whether the nationality and the territorial places where they were committed, the crime of aggression seem to confine uh, certain limitations to certain limitations, like uh, the certain persons may not be prosecuted or investigated unless they are nationals of a particular state party. Uh, that is something that we'll have to deal with. Again, it's a very tricky area, as I said. It is progressing. Uh, it has been progressing gradually towards its uh, adoption since that adoption. And a number of other issues that lie with it, including uh, when it had to be operational and all that. Okay. So, um, we are clear, we've just been dwelling under uh, the, the referral by a state party um, of matters to the ICC. We also looked at uh, a, uh, a few instances where uh, the referral may be by the UN, but we're going to deal with this even more exhaustively in the next couple of uh, minutes. All right, just to recap again, um, the prosecutor may have initiate investigations proprio motu. Proprio motu, I hope you're taking lecture notes. Uh, P R O P R I O. Motu is M O T U. Proprio motu at her own instance. Uh, only if the crimes were committed within the jurisdiction of the ICC. And uh, the national of the state party, or in the territory of the state party. So you can see the confines. As I said uh, in retrospect, just a few minutes ago, the referral, uh, the initiated uh, initiation by the prosecutor would only be pursued if it appears he can initiate or she can initiate the proceedings when it appears that that individual is a national of the state party or it was committed on the territory of the state party. That is entirely unlike the Security Council that can refer a situation regardless of whether the nationality of the accused is that of a state party or a non-state party, and regardless of the territorial location of the crime. And it's also important to note that under the 
uh, Security Council referral, uh, the Security Council may defer a matter for another one year in the interest of uh, international peace. Uh, so um, those are mechanisms that have been put in place uh, to be able to compromise uh, the interest groups and also to safeguard uh, the interests of the parties involved at the same time. <clears throat> okay, so here we, we looked, that is the Security Council would convene when the matter is, is of a serious security concern. Uh, it will proceed under the Charter of the United Nations, um, uh, have the matter examined, and it feels that this matter is of gravity and have it referred to uh, the prosecutor to be able to proceed with the issue. Okay, we can see that um, based on these, and one other point, when the matter is referred by but by a party, it could be actually an NGO, an individual, and uh, the way the referral is made is such that um, the process seeks to uh, protect the person, the individuals or the entities that are sending the information to the ICC prosecutor so that there is no witch hunt whatsoever uh, and uh, to backfire on those who have uh, revealed information that's critical for ICC investigations uh, to be conducted. Okay, so uh, by and large, that is how the ICC uh, ensures its proceedings are initiated. And uh, we just want to underscore the important thing, as I said, complementarity is a cornerstone of the jurisdiction of the ICC, of how the ICC operates, as well as cooperation. We noticed that there was a section, a division of the prosecutor's office dedicated to jurisdictional matters, complementarity and cooperation. Why cooperation? Cooperation, as I said, because uh, without cooperation, the ICC would be rendered a toothless uh, bulldog uh, because it relies on the states to carry out the enforceability, to enforce, for instance, the warrants of arrest, to enforce the judgments of the court. So uh, without it, the ICC does not have a police force. It does not have any security apparatus that would enforce this kind of uh, processes, judicial processes that it has. But it has to rely entirely on the cooperation of the national states or of the other states to be able to assist in the process, including uh, to be able to secure evidence through investigations in certain instances. All right. Um, apart from that, having talked about arrest and uh, execution of judgment, uh, I, I think we need to touch something on arrests, actually. The, um, the ICC has no powers, nothing, nothing as an instrument, sorry, to be able to carry out arrests. So there is a predominant 100% reliance upon um, individuals, individuals from uh, the state to be able to effect the arrest uh, at the time of insertion of the investigations. Okay, so as we said, uh, there's no arrest warrant that may be issued and no summons may be, to appear may be issued unless it has been authorized by the pretrial chamber. All the prosecutor may do is just present the request to the pretrial chamber and the pretrial chamber would then be able to examine, to ensure they are not politically motivated, there are sufficient um, uh, plausible legal grounds to justify uh, a charge of pursuing the investigations. Uh, but what, how does the prosecutor proceed at the trial chamber, pretrial chamber, when seeking, for instance, authorization 
uh, of the pretrial chamber in the processes of investigation or arrest. Uh, the pretrial chamber, for instance, will need to know the description, uh, the nature of the crime uh, that uh, the person is suspected of having committed. Why? Because it would want to know whether it is within the scope of the jurisdiction of the ICC. Does it fall under the uh, Article 5 crimes in the Rome Statute? If it is not in, does not fall among those five, I mean, among the crimes under Article 5, the four major crimes, then it is in the negative. The decision is bound to be uh, declined. The application is bound to be declined. The decision is bound to uh, reject the request. It would also need to look at the facts related to um, whatever has occasioned the need uh, for that prosecution. Yeah, and that includes the evidence, forensic or otherwise, uh, and uh, motivation by the prosecutor. Of course, the, the, the persons who are being named, persons have to be named. The, the individual person must come on so that they know who exactly are being sought by the prosecutor. And uh, the motivation as to why uh, the office of the prosecutor believes that uh, such persons should be arrested to advance the interest of justice. Okay, um, I think we that brings us almost to the end. I want us to recap very, very uh, quickly what we have covered today. As I said, having looked at the structure of the International Criminal Court, an overview of the International Court, Criminal Court, uh, basically the history of evolution, and also having looked at uh, uh, the crimes, Article 5 crimes, as enshrined in the uh, Rome Statute, and there are elements that are uh, expounded in Article 6 up to 18, 8, sorry, Having also uh, examined that Article 17 underscores complementarity, uh, which uh, recognizes the sovereignty of the states as having primacy against internationalization of uh, the interest of justice for the whole entire global community. And so uh, we've looked at all that. We have uh, also gone to see that actually the International Criminal Court does not act retroactively. It can only exercise jurisdiction beginning from a certain point. Uh, it, it could be retroactive, but to a point. It's only to a point. It's not retroactive in the sense that there are no crimes. The crimes committed before the Rome Statute came into force cannot be subject of the jurisdiction of uh, the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction whatsoever over crimes, about crimes that were committed, allegedly committed before the Rome Statute came into force. Similarly, uh, if a party was not a member to the Rome Statute, had not ratified it, and uh, became a member some years after the ratification, then it cannot, as a general rule, be charged, there's no offense that can be examined the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction over offenses that were carried out before that particular state party became a party. So uh, it only commences as soon as it becomes a party. But as we say, there's an exception. Like in law, there's always an exception to the general rule. The exception here is that unless that particular new party, state party, allows uh, consents to the jurisdiction of the court, the International Criminal Court, of offenses that were committed even after, even before it came, it became a party to the International uh, Criminal Court Rome Statute. Uh, we are then able to look at uh, the issue apart from, uh, we also indicated that the court is a court of last resort. That's tied to primacy. The two principles of ter territoriality and um, uh, personality, the nationality principle, are very critical. How? 
uh, is critical because they underscore the principle, the old principles, the even customary law under international criminal law, international law that recognize states have jurisdiction over their own nationals in respect of prosecution, investigation, and prosecution of crimes. Secondly, states have jurisdiction over offenses that were committed within his territory, regardless of who committed, whether they were non-nationals. That has been a long-standing principle. That is recognized. It underscores the reason why sovereignty principle was a key element in consideration during the Rome Statute negotiations. So that the balance, those who argued for sovereignty, infringement of sovereignty would uh, be occasioned by adopting the statute would see that that was maintained under the principle of complementarity as enshrined in Article 17 of the Rome Statute. And those who argued that the peace, international security is so critical that the broader global interest must be maintained. Those insisted that that was more important and overruled, overran the primacy. So the compromise between the two allowed for the mechanism that is incorporated in the principle of complementarity under Article 17 of the Rome Statute, where the court can intervene if actually the national state party uh, conducts, uh, is unwilling or unable genuinely to conduct proceedings. Uh, uh, and even if they are doing a parallel proceeding going on, but if they don't uh, prove, if there's no proof that, uh, if it's not proved before the trial chamber that uh, those proceedings are genuine, then or uh, the uh, state is um, willing, then those matters would be adopted by the International Criminal Court for lack of willingness and lack of uh, inability, lack of ability to conduct the proceedings. Uh, we also noticed that the court, we noted that the court is of a permanent nature as contrasted with the ad hoc uh, tribunals, such as the ITC, ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, International Criminal Tribunal for Roma Yugoslavia. Uh, we also indicated that uh, the court is not universal because it is confined it's limited by virtue of either state party where it can only exercise jurisdiction over certain individuals or the territorial uh, parties, certain territorial considerations in respect of this. And uh, it's important to equal note that there's equality before the law. Unlike the previous tribunals, uh, the victor's justice, those that would uh, the British, the, the superpowers after the wars, uh, with the military tribunals that were convened to punish uh, the losers. But uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, the proceeding, the Rome Statute, managed to court defy the key, for once, all the key elements and the offenses were codified and was clear uh, what offenses constituted those heinous international crimes and who could be prosecuted and how and the scope. So that is also important. Um, we looked at, at so it's, it's critical not to forget the issue that we looked at, uh, the issue of nationality and territoriality of individuals uh, that as a general had jurisdiction over uh, uh, persons who are nationals of a state party and of our territories of those who are only state parties. Uh, all right, uh, finally, we are able to see that the key ways of initiating or triggering jurisdiction of the ICC, the trigger mechanisms were one, by the matter being referred by the state party to the ICC, or by a willing non-state party, uh, we have examples of those ones where the state, the party like uh, Uganda transferred a uh, matter before the court. We have those that were started pro like the Kenya cases, 
uh, we have a proper motive is where the uh, uh, prosecutor initiated proceedings on her own accord. But as we said, you must remember that if the prosecutor initiates, there's always the pretrial chamber judges hovering just to see that the mechanism is maintaining integrity. There's integrity in the process. Um, I would say before the prosecutor actually actualizes the proprio motu approach, the information must be presented before the information we listed must be presented before the pretrial judges who will examine and determine whether there is legal possibility, the sustainable legal justification to proceed with the charges before it proceeds. And then lastly, we looked at uh, the referral by the United Nations Security Council, where the matter is referred, it's a matter of security of concern, and it's referred to uh, the uh, International Criminal Court or prosecutor for further dealing. And that one we said, when that referral is made, it doesn't matter whether the nationals concerned are not, uh, are members of a non-state party. It's regardless of whether the, the parties concerned are not even, uh, the, it was carried out in the territory of a non-state party. This becomes a question of international security. And it's also important to qualify that the United Nations security could defer the matter for one year in the interest of peace, um, so that the matter is not dealt with immediately, but the prosecution begins after a year. So I wanna thank you very much. Uh, for That brings us to the end of this lecture in terms of uh, the procedures and the trigger mechanisms of the international, for international criminal court jurisdiction. And uh, I hope that that has helped to form a basis. Basically, we try to present these lectures in a simplified form to take into account lay persons. We are not just having an audience of lawyers and we are people who are new, completely green about international criminal law. So we try to simplify them and try to avoid as much technical uh, approach as possible so that the lay person may be able to follow and understand how the International Criminal Court operates. But this way we know that when we engage with the world and um, everybody else, regardless of their position in life, we help to have a concerted approach to be able to surmount all those impediments, bottlenecks, anything inimical that would militate against the attainment of the goals of the International Criminal Justice. We in the academia, we will belong into uh, in the legal academia, have a role as intellectuals, as scholars, to be able to examine even problems. As of now, there are still teething problems facing the International Criminal Court, notwithstanding it's been there for a long time. We want to have a retrospective analysis, introspective analysis, and prospective glance of the future of the court. It is our responsibility as intellectuals to examine this, to reevaluate and reassess the provisions of the Rome Statute, and to be able to analyze the proceedings and see in what way as intellectuals, as those in the academia, we can contribute uh, to the betterment of uh, the International Criminal Court. We are looking at all factors that emanate basically from the shortcomings, all the challenges that the International Criminal Court are facing. We are giving them interrogation. And that is why we are having uh, live panel discussions, as I've indicated. It has nothing to do with this lecture, but which uh, will be uh, addressed by expert uh, professors and those in experts in international criminal law judges, uh, trial lawyers, police prosecutors, uh, investigators, uh, will be offering their views from an expert perspective in live panel uh, panel discussion, discourse over these matters. So be on the lookout. Uh, anytime now we may start those live sessions as, as uh, soon as are finalized with uh, LinkedIn so that we may be able to reach a wider section of uh, our audience. But for the sake of this lecture, I want to thank you very much for being part of it. 
And uh, we hope that uh, next time we'll be able to look at, uh, you, you may read ahead and see how to effect arrest. And uh, we look at the, uh, the parties to the litigation before the court. We are talking about victims, reparations, uh, the suspects, what rights they have uh, for the defense, that is, the prosecutors. We'll also look again at uh, how the charges are proceeding, uh, the proceedings are conducted before the court, the trials uh, under the trial chamber, the pre-trial chamber. We'll also examine, as a matter of fact, how the matter ends, uh, the, the decisions arrived at the judgment. And uh, of course, as we said, we do not have death penalties uh, made out, but the life sentences, uh, like and also those up to 30, in extreme cases, life sentences at 30 years and so on. Uh, and also looking at the age factor of the accused, whether the jurisdiction they could be meted, we'll look at all those, we'll be able to examine all that. And uh, we can't, conclude without having to look at the role of the appellate court uh, to be able to review the decisions. That is where the integrity of the ICC is. I'd already given a hint how the appeal chamber sits and looks into what the trial chambers and the pre-trial chamber, whoever is dissatisfied or aggrieved by the decisions of these lower chambers are core, would be able to approach the appellate jurisdiction to look at them. We'll quickly uh, examine those ones. And also, as I said, uh, how? Because this is the only court that uh, has prominently featured uh, the participation of the victims in terms of reparations. Uh, so we look at how the representation is carried out, uh, how the registry is critical in coordinating the operations and administration and taking care of uh, the interest of the the victims, and uh, as well as witnesses, uh, how they are protected, uh, the protection scheme to ensure that uh, valuable evidence is not lost. Uh, so there's still much more ahead for us uh, to be able to cover. Uh, these lectures will continue at straight and uh, we'll continue to cover uh, most critical areas of international criminal law. For now, thank you very much for being part of the lecture and hope to see you next time. This is Dr. Advocate Milton, uh, hold a PhD in International Criminal.